global catchphrase is ideas worth spreading. That's why we're here. When we combine that with the theme of TEDx Yerevan, uh, I was assuming it's not, Beyond Borders, anywhere? The theme of TEDx Yerevan is Beyond Borders. When we combine that with the theme of TEDx Yerevan, Beyond Borders, I was told I'm not supposed to move around too much, so I apologize. Uh, when we combine those two themes together, we end up with a unique challenge. In our time of highly accessible knowledge, are there truly any really great ideas that we here in Armenia can deem worthy of exporting outside of our small landlocked country? Is it possible that ideas exist in Yerevan or in Prague or in Abidjan or in Berlin that have never been thought of or at least heard of in Seattle or in Shanghai or in Delhi or in New York? Perhaps, but probably not. The, uh, the author David Brooks uh, writes the following. He says, in this era, in our present day, ideas and knowledge are at least as vital to economic success as natural resources and finance capital. It's a powerful statement. Ideas and knowledge are as important as resources and as finance. His statement was referring to corporations, generally, and perhaps even, and more importantly, to small emerging democracies uh, like ours. But the, um, the critical point of his statement is that corporations and countries are made up of people. So at its foundation, this theory must take place at the level of the individual, if it is true. It is the individual's ability to achieve economic success that drives many of us in our daily tasks. It is the individual's worth, your value to society, that will most likely determine your own personal satisfaction and happiness in life. Therefore, my question to you today is very simple. What are you worth? Have you ever asked yourself that question? Many of you have, some of you even may have answers to it. But what are you worth? We can, of course, answer this question a number of ways from a number of perspectives. And for the sake of full disclosure, this is in no way intended to be an exhaustive list of categories that I'm about to provide. But first, let's try clinically. If you add up the 65% oxygen, the 18% carbon, the 10% nit hydrogen, and the 3% nitrogen that is in your body with all of the other chemicals that are floating around, and all the minerals that are making up your body mass, you end up being worth, on average, $4.85. <laughs> Less than $5. You are worth about the same as a small size Happy Meal. <laughs> I have more bad news. This is only until you die, because once you begin to decompose, then your body quickly becomes worth a whole lot less. But certainly this is not the only way to assess your value, so let's look at your worth on the open market. According to Wired magazine, when we break, down, break you down into fluids, into organs, into tissues, uh, you dramatically increase in value. Some estimates place your worth as high as $40 million. Now you're feeling better. For example, in today's market, your lungs are worth about $125,000. Each kidney is $100,000. A heart is $65,000. Eyes, skin, etc., all of these begin to add up. By far, the most valuable things you have are your DNA, $9 million, and bone marrow, $25 million. Now you're feeling a lot better. However, and here's the catch, unfortunately, selling your body parts on the open market is illegal and unethical. And incidentally, you'll find it to be impossible if you'd like to keep on living. So we have to go back and find another way. You're worth economically. Let's try that. If you're the head of a household, or if you share those duties with your spouse or with your partner, then your lifetime earning potential becomes very, very important and could be perhaps very, very great. The amount of money you can earn now and into the future is a vital concern not only to you, but to your family members as well. If mom or dad has a good job with high earnings potential, then their child can go to better schools, live in better neighborhoods, have access to better health care, enjoy a higher quality of life through nutrition, education, longer periods of rest. You even drive in safer cars. You have better friends. But if you add to that, that in addition to being a good earner, you also have secured your family's financial future with investments, with life insurance, with wise financial planning, then your worth can be very high. 
And indeed, in most cases, your worth to your family becomes incalculable. So it's worth even more than the 40 million that I had mentioned. The next way is you have personal worth. Even if you have no job, no income, no money in the bank, and you have no hope of that changing any time in the future, chances are that you are still worth very much to your loved ones. A newborn child, for example, completely dependent in every way upon his parents, among them financially. But his worth is immeasurable. You cannot say he's not worth anything. His worth is everything to that family. A beloved grandmother who has lived a full life, raised a wonderful family, and yet spent all of her savings on long-term health care may be penniless today. But can anyone question her worth and her value to her children and to her grandchildren? So then, what do we do? In light of all of these conflicting formulas, there emerges only one common denominator. Apparently, worth must be relative. And if we agree with conventional wisdom that worth is indeed relative, we can then make very easy and very well-known comparisons. I'm not the first one to say this. For example, isn't the surgeon who saves lives in the operating room worth more isn't he a bigger asset to society than the criminal, than the drug dealer who ruins young lives? Many of you in the room would probably say yes. But our central question remains, what are you worth? Which methodology should we use to determine your value? One year ago this week, a man died in Dallas, Texas. He was perhaps the singular individual of the 20th century who positively affected more people's lives than any other human being on the planet. It is a powerful statement, and listen to why I am making this statement. I am certain that many of you, if not most of you, have never even heard of him. He was not a politician, he was not a king, he was not a pope, in fact, he was not a world leader at all. He was not rich, and he was not even what has now become the most important thing in enlightened life, uh, in today's world, a celebrity. He never heard of Paris Hilton. He did, however, win the Nobel Peace Prize. He won the US Presidential Medal of Freedom. He won the Congressional Gold Medal. He won India's most prestigious award, the Padma Vibhushan Medal. He won the US National Medal of Science, among countless others. He is quite possibly the only person in history to have done so. He held 49 honorary degrees from major universities in 18 different countries. He was a member of 22 international academies of science. He may be the greatest scientist benefactor the world has never known. In his obituary last year, the New York Times wrote the following. His work had a far-reaching impact on the lives of millions of people in developing countries. His breeding of high-yielding crop varieties helped to avert mass famines that were widely predicted in the 1960s, altering the course of human history. Largely because of his work, countries that had been food-dependent, like Mexico and India, became self-sufficient. And in presenting him with the Peace Prize, the Nobel Committee said the following, more than any other single person of his age, he helped provide bread for a hungry world. He would, in fact, become, he would in fact come to be known as the man who fed the world, because by developing a wheat strain with an unusual gene that created semi-dwarf plants, the results he achieved were nothing short of astonishing. His name was Norman Borlaug. How many of you in this room have ever heard of Norman Borlaug? Two, three, let's say five. He saved the lives of one billion people. Billion with a B. One-sixth of the world's population. One thousand million people lived because of Norman Borlaug. His research and innovation first tripled and then quadrupled wheat output throughout the world. His idea was applied to rice, which is the staple crop today for nearly half of the world's population. In India alone, rice yields jumped several fold overnight. In Mexico, wheat output increased sixfold from 1940 to 1960. 
One billion people went from food dependency to self-sufficiency. Now that is beyond borders. So I ask you, what was his life worth? Why don't you ask the one billion people whose lives he saved? So I asked myself that very same question in preparing for this talk. How do you quantify the contributions of Norman Borlaug and many, many others like him, who worked tirelessly for years, even decades, without riches, without glory, without notoriety, simply because they are driven, they are driven to improve the quality of human life anywhere on the planet for countless others whom they will never meet? The answer is not as elusive as you may think. In fact, it is an instinct that all of us are born with. But time and experience and delusion and age steadily harden our hearts and make us forget this truth. After spending 10 years as an architect and then six years as a priest, after being an entrepreneur and an employee, after working in the private sector, after working in the public sector, after living in the US for almost my entire life and then living here in Armenia for the past decade, after all of this, after working with all nationalities, all cultures, all faiths, meeting with world leaders, working on construction sites, I'm here to tell you that every individual human life, every single life does not have relative value. Every life has absolute value. So what does that mean? So it does not mean, it, what it means, it does not matter what you're worth clinically, socially, economically, or any other measurable way. It matters what you do. The one point that I want you to take away from my talk is this. Not everything that counts in life can be counted. Not everything that, can, that has value can be measured. Norman Borlaug, if he were standing here today, would have undoubtedly been the first to tell you that even with his incomparable contribution to the quality of human life in the developing world, his life was not worth any more or any less than the life of the farmer or the villager or the laborer that he saved. So now I ask you again, what are you worth? You are worth the sum total of all human lives, past, present, and future on this planet. Human life is the one condition where one equals 100, equals 1 million, equals 6 billion. Every one of you in this room is worth the entire population of this earth. $4.85 equals 40 million, equals the infinite. The Talmud has the following passage. For this reason, man was created alone, to teach you that whoever destroys a single soul is guilty as though he has destroyed the entire world. Whoever saves and preserves a single soul is as though he has saved the entire world. Said in another way, whoever saves one life saves the world entire. Now you may say, he's a priest, this is all nice to hear, but realistically, he's oversimplifying life a lot. My answer is yes, I am oversimplifying it because it is simple and it's also true. As individuals, we have absolutely no control over so many things of our life, especially over issues of life and death. However, we do have control over ourselves. We have control over our own actions. We can affect change. We can live our lives in such a manner that we bring honor to ourselves, and through those actions, we can live lives that are worthy and make us worthy of the intrinsic, absolute value and worth that each of us already possesses. Each of you in this room, every one of you, has made choices that brought you here today. And each of you will continue to make those choices after you leave this auditorium and you go back to your lives. Norman Borlaug made those same choices. And he took an idea worth spreading, and he implemented that idea beyond the borders, not only of his community, of his town, of his home state, of his country, but throughout the entire world. These choices we make are not isolated incidents or events. Each decision affects a subsequent one. There is an old saying that no one suddenly gets lost in the forest. Every step off the correct path in the wrong direction is compounded by the succeeding step. Conversely, every step in the right direction to correct your path, regardless of how small it is, gets us closer and closer to the way we're supposed to be going. 
What this means, basically, is it's never too late to start doing the right thing. You're never too old to change your life. You're never too old to make a right decision. You're never too old to say, I want to live a different life than the one I'm living. It's just that the longer you wait, the longer it's going to take for you to come back to the way you were supposed to be. In the book of Genesis, upon murdering his own brother and being questioned by God as to Abel's whereabouts, Cain says and indignantly replies, why are you asking me? Am I my brother's keeper? The answer to Cain's angry response is an overwhelming and resounding yes. Yes, you are your brother's keeper. Yes, you are your neighbor's guardian. Yes, you are your friend's protector. Yes, yes, a thousand times yes. We are all responsible for each other because one of us is worth all of us. Before we walk out of this room today to return to our lives, we should ask ourselves, during the very limited amount of time that I have on this earth, am I here to have and to be, or am I here to do and to give? Gandhi famously said, the difference between what you do and what you are capable of doing would suffice to solve most of the world's problems. Gandhi knew this, Norman Borlaug knew this, and so should all of we. Thank you very much. <laughs>